Good morning to you all. Um, this morning I want to talk about uh, relationships, uh, particularly marriages, good relationships, because I obviously appreciate that this stream is about sustainability. And when I was thinking about sustainability, I often think about sustainability, not just obviously work life, but also personal life. And I have a confession to make because incidents do make you stronger. I am on my second marriage and final, and it got me thinking about sustainability. And uh, we all dream and hope that when we walk down the aisle that we are there at 95 years old on our rocking chair with our Horlicks and our, uh, uh, our slippers with our partner. But often, as we know, that isn't what ends up. And I start to think, why? And I start to flick that over then to an organisation of the relationship that we should have between the partners of risk and reward. And that's what this session is really all about. And it really stems from the fact that with so much going on in risk management, particularly financial services at the moment, and uh, the Royal Commission, which we talk about a little bit tomorrow, also the APRA report on the CBA. Um, and a lot of that was talking about the voices that were not being heard equally. And in a marriage, there's a voice of both partners. And this is all about the balance between the voices of the partners in the marriage to make it successful. So I'm going to start off on a really good note, which is two glasses of champagne, which might resonate tonight better, and uh, celebrating the happy marriage between risk and reward. What does that look like? Now, in terms of it, I want to talk about four things. The first one is to meet the partners. Secondly, relationship dynamics between the partners in the relationship. Number three, managing the marriage because it needs work, let's be honest, managing the a relationship between the partners, and finally reporting on the health of the marriage. And that's what I want to cover. Now the first one then is to think about meeting the partners. And I want to have a look at the reward partner and a look at the risk partner. Now probably a couple of years ago, I couldn't put the next slide up, but I'm very proud to say that I can, because we need to think about who these partners in the relationship are. And we know that it could be, or it could be, or it could be. Now, for no other reason than tradition and making the two look different, I'm going to choose the one in the middle and the risk and reward partnership. So let's see if we can meet the partners in the marriage and understand them a bit better. Now, the only reason I have labelled the female as risk is because the Australian slang that we use, when you tell someone when they're just about to do something, watch out for, and they go, she'll be right. And she'll be right is actually risk. And she'll be right means, don't worry with all that risk stuff, I want to go and get reward. So as a result, I've labelled the female for risk. That's the only reason. And that obviously makes the other person reward. So let's think about what risk and reward are about. Let's learn a bit more about them. Firstly, risk. Risk is the effect of uncertainty on objectives. Objectives, or sorry, reward is the degree to which we meet our objectives. Now that includes both financial and non-financial objectives. So if we think about it, straight away we have a connection and a strong bond between these partners. Because one is reward the degree to which we meet our objectives, and the other one is the effect that uncertainty can have on objectives. And it always amazes me the number of times we work, particularly with new clients, and the word risk is king because we deal with risk managers and very rarely do they mention reward. It's all about risk. It's all about putting more controls over that risk to try and minimise it down to nothing or try and eliminate it. And, and as we're going to see in a minute, that's not such a great thing in a marriage. When you eliminate a partner, it doesn't usually work quite well. So when we now have looked at our partners, let's move on a little bit to think about the depth of that partner. Now, reward is the degree to which we meet our objectives, both financial and non-financial. Now, importantly, and this obviously is prominent in the Royal Commission, is that the objective should cover the objectives of all stakeholders, all stakeholders, not just the shareholder, as APRA refers to in the CBA report, the voice of finance. It should cover the customer, the member, if you are a mutual, the employee, the suppliers, the regulators, the society or society, and very importantly, the leaves on the trees and the water and the environment. Let's move over to risk now. Risk is the effect of uncertainty on objectives. Again, as the objectives for reward cover all of the stakeholders, so should the risks cover all stakeholders. 
So what risk do we have that affect the shareholder? Yes, we do that quite well. What about the customer? Again, the member, the employee, and all of the shareholders, we, all of the stakeholders we spoke about earlier. So now we're starting to get a linkage because the link is the anchor through the stakeholders. And we've got them there, typically seven or eight or nine stakeholders that we all have. And obviously the balance between those is something about your strategy. What's more important, the shareholder or the member or the environment? Now let's go and have a look at the couple's child. Because the children can tell us an awful lot about risk, and that's what I want to do now. And I want to introduce you to Jenny. There's Jenny, she's seven years old, and she's attempting to achieve an objective. And with anybody that's a parent or otherwise, might kind of appreciate she's facing some risk. Now let's have a little chat with her about what she is trying to do from beginning to end. And number one is, what is Jenny's or what are Jenny's objectives? And they are them. Now, the most obvious one for a child is, number one, to have fun. But she's a great kid, she also wants to be safe, and she's a fantastic kid because she wants to comply with the park rules. Now, as with our own objectives in our organisations, we'll prioritise these objectives. And I'm sure the child would prioritise number one, above number two, above number three. And it's very important we as organisations also prioritise our objectives and are very explicit with what those prioritisations are. We'll cover this later. But when I see an organisation that tells me that they are there for the care and the value add to the customer and they promote that on all their materials and then they go in-house and they talk to the brokers and go, mate, just sell, sell. And we've got something being said externally and internally, we're actually reprioritising for the voice of shareholder over the voice of customer. Might sound familiar in financial services. Now once we have our objectives, risk doesn't come from the objectives, it comes from what we need to do to achieve the objectives. So the second step to feed us into risk is what are the critical things that Jenny needs to successfully achieve in order to meet her objectives? And I would put to you there are three things. She needs to get up to the top of the rock safely, play on top of the rock safely, get back to ground level safely. And if she can achieve those three steps, she's achieved her objectives. Now, once we have identified those critical steps, we can now identify things that could stop her achieving those critical steps. We happen to call those risk. As a parent, falling is probably the most obvious one. Now, falling is a risk event. And a risk event for us is the point at which you lose control. So if I am walking along and I start toppling off, that's the point of lost control and that is my risk event falling risk. I'm going to stand a little bit back from here. Now at this stage we don't know why Jenny might fall. So I'm going to come up with five reasons she might fall and we obviously call those the root causes. She's just a seven-year-old, human error. It rained last night, liquid hazard, slippery um, ground, moss on the rock, making it slippery and so on. Now that's our root causes. So as a result, we've gone all the way back from objectives through critical process, through risk events to root causes. And then we think about how do we control that risk? And I've given you six potential controls that we could use. From inspections to clean up, non-slip shoes, first aid. Now I want to put this all together in a picture. And some of you that know Protect, you know we love bow ties. So bow tie analysis is the way that we can pull that all together, our favoured approach, and it goes something like this if you're not familiar with bow ties. In the middle of the bow tie, we put the point at which you lose control, which is the risk event, and that's falling. We then move either left or right. I'm going to go right, sorry, left first to go back to the root cause, and we do that by asking, but why? And we keep on asking, but why, until the answer is it just is or it's outside of our influence. Let's go. She's just a kid. Why is she just a kid? Well, she's just a kid. So human error in this instance is one of our causes because it just is. Liquid hazard on the ground, but why? It rained last night. Is the level of rainfall within Jenny's influence? No, it is not. So it's one of her root causes. It's an external root cause. I'm not going to say and explain each one of these. I'll leave the rest to your own thinking. And that gives us our root causes. We've now expanded that left-hand side to go back to the source, the root cause of the risk. 
We then go the other way by asking, but what next? And we don't stop until one or more of our objectives has been impacted. And you can see on the right-hand side, those three boxes equate to the objectives that Jenny had in the first place. Now, obviously, in risk management, we call the first one root causes, the bits in the middle risk events, and the right-hand side risk impacts. And impact should always equal your objectives. I'm still amazed at the times we go to, out to new clients and we look at their impact register, impact list of items, and they don't correspond with objectives. There is no linkage between risk and reward, which makes no sense whatsoever. So one of the first takeaways is to ensure that your impact types in risk management exactly equal the objectives out of the strategic and the business plans. Once we've got that, we can put the outline around it, and that obviously gives us the bow tie. We can then start adding our controls on at the appropriate spot. Inspections and cleanup for liquid hazard and moss hazard. Training for the child. Non-slip shoes. Cushion, safety hat, and first aid. Now what we've done here is gone through that picture of risk from left to right and put various controls in place. Now the controls on the left are preventive controls, the controls in the middle are detective controls and the controls on the right are reactive or corrective controls. Now once we look at that we have the picture of marriage because on the board there we have both partners because on the left hand side everything around falling is risk. And there we have the bride. And everything on the right-hand side, which is impacts, is equal to objectives, which is reward. And there is the groom. So one of the key things here is that in risk management, we should never, ever talk about risk without talking about its partner. It's, it's rude. So if we talk about risk, we need to be talking about reward or the objectives. Because if you're not, you're not connecting the partnership together. Now, the two ways to do that, or the first way to do that, sorry, is make sure that in every discussion or sentence you use the word risk, you also mention reward. We train a lot of frontline managers, not risk managers, and they complain about risk managers talking about risk and having to control everything and spend lots of money on controls and causing the business a lot of overheads and so on. And I say to them, the answer or the question you should ask is, why do you want me to add that control in? And if they say, oh, it's because it's risky, then you ask the second question, what objectives of my business does this risk affect? And a risk manager who doesn't think risk reward will go, well, it's just risk, you've got, to, you've got to control it. Well, unacceptable. You've got to be able to link it and explain how it in any way affects the objectives of the organisation, risk reward. Now, that is the most common um, diagram that we use to explain the marriage, risk and reward, and it should sit on one sheet, which means we are looking at both partners at the same time. So now we understand what the partners in the relationship are, let's have a look at the relationship dynamics. How do they relate together? How does the marriage work? So how do risk and reward interact? And secondly, are they enemies or best friends? Well, let's be honest, with sustainability, enemies are not going to last long. If they are friends, then we're going to have a sustainable relationship, a sustainable marriage. So let's think about now the dynamics. Well, let's go back to the definition of risk out of the ISO 31000 standard, and it says risk is the effect of uncertainty on objectives. Risk is the effect of the bride on the groom, the connection. Now, if risk is the effect of uncertainty on objectives, managing risk must be managing the effect of uncertainty on objectives. So I would put to you, sorry for all of you in the room, risk management as a discipline is ridiculous. I don't know why we call ourselves risk managers, because that's not what we really do. What we really do is that because we are managing the effect of uncertainty on objectives. So what we're really doing is managing objectives. So I wish our industry was actually called outcome managers. Now this creates magic. Why? You go up to your frontline management team or CEO or whatever and say, good morning, I'd like to have a chat with you. And they go, who are you? I'm David from Risk Management. They look at their diary and, and miraculously there's no room for six to eight weeks. I'll come back to you in 10 weeks. Good morning, it's Dave here. Where are you from? I'm from outcome management, at the risk of sounding like a consultant. And they say, what do you do? And I say, I'm here to help you nail your objectives. I bet they're going to say cappuccino or latte. I bet I get a seat at the table on day one. 
So the first thing to remember that we're not risk managers, we are objectives managers. And each of you that are as a risk manager, I want you to add a translator chip into your brain right now and give one to every employee in your organization and it works like this. Slot it in right now, in it goes. And every time you hear the word risk management, you say to yourselves, outcome management. And your face will go from a grimace to a smile because you're now talking about the relationship between risk and reward, not risk in its own right. So let's have a look at outcome management as an example. Now, this is a lovely main road in Nairobi in Kenya. We used to have an office over there, but um, because of the roads like that, or partly, that's the scenario. Our objective in my example is to get to the end of the road safely. The potholes obviously represent risk because they create uncertainty as to the achievement of my objective of getting to the end of the road safely. So let's have an approach at management wise how we might try and achieve our objective. Number one, just floor it flat out. Drag race up to the end, hopefully jump over the potholes. Now this is about she'll be right brigade because they want to get to the end of the road. When you mention the potholes, they ah, oh, she'll be right. What could be the result of this? Well, the first time they go, they might luckily make it. Second time might luckily make it. Seventh time. On the eighth time, however, that's what happens. We call this boom bust management. Boom, 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 all the time, life is good. Something comes along, bust. And we're very good at that in business, particularly financial services. It usually takes seven years for the bust to come along, but it does. Now this kind of relationship is where the male or reward is the biggest. And the female risk is tiny because we're not listening to the voice of risk. And that will be boom, 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 bust. Because after a while, the risk partner who's being ignored gets kind of annoyed and frustrated and bursts out of the closet and go, remember me? Who are you? I'm your partner in your marriage. Oh, sorry, I forgot about you. And then we have the global financial crisis. And then we worry about the risk partner lots and ignore the reward partner. I'll come to that later. So that is not a happy marriage. Number two. We look at the holes and they scare the hell out of us. And we are so paranoid about falling in a hole. We are so scared, we give up. I'm not even going to attempt it. This is called avoidance or elimination. In this instance, obviously, zero success. We just give up, we go home, so we're never going to achieve anything. Right? And in this instance, we've got a tiny male reward and a really big female risk because we're focusing too much on risk in this scenario. Number three, we look at the potholes, they scare the hell out of us, but we really want to get to the end of that road. So what do we do? We buy some really big wheels and tyres. It slows the car down dramatically and costs an absolute fortune. So it takes us two hours to get to the end of the road, and by the time we're there, we're bankrupt. Now this is the same problem as the first one, but for a different reason. And this is where the mail is very small. We're not worrying about reward. Cost doesn't matter, and risk is huge. Same as the one before, but through too many controls, bogging the business down. So what's the solution? I would suggest that. Smartly manoeuvring around each pothole as you come up to it. Quick left, quick right, 25 kilometers an hour, slow down, brake, left, right, and we weave our way up through the road. Now as we're doing that, we are now focusing on the reward, yes, and we are focusing on risk, but we're not overdoing it. I would put to you that there is where we will get success. And success is sustainable reward. It's not boom, 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 bust. It's boom, 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 which is reasonable profits, but not crazy. But we can keep on repeating that year after year and we'll end up with our partner at 95 years old still holding hands because we've got a balance between the two. Now that, to me, is success. That's what sustainability is all about. My one by one objective in risk management is sustainable reward. That's it. That's what we do, sustainable reward. So to sum that up then, if we look at the partnership, reward is the main focus, risk is secondary, she'll be right, boom bust. Reward, secondary focus, everything's too risky around here. Our main focus is risk, no boom whatsoever, therefore long-term bust. 50%, 50%, equals long-term sustainability. Now that is the dynamics between the partnership. So let's now think about the relationship and how the dynamics work. Firstly, generally, 
as long as you're taking reasonably smart risks, the greater the risk, the greater the average expected reward. However, the greater the risk, the greater the potential variation around that expected outcome. Now, many, many years ago, I did a, um, a degree in business finance and so on, and I remember doing a class on economics, which introduced me to the concept of this. Some of you might remember this from your uni days. Uh, the capital asset pricing model, or CAPM, probably gives you uh, nervous twitches thinking about that. Here it goes. This is a map of the partner, male return or reward up the left. We have now risk, the other partner, on the horizontal axis, and we map the two as how they relate, and they relate like this. Let's have a look at expected reward or expected relationship, and it looks like that. And on the left-hand side, that's the level of return we're going to get for taking no risk. We call it the risk-free return. If you're thinking about it financially, like say investing in a three-year government bond, very low risk, only sovereign risk, but obviously a very low reward. As you move to the right and take more risk and make the risk partner bigger, on average, expected return for the other partner goes up. Now, obviously, without any other additional um, uh, information, it would make sense to always have massive risk and massive reward, but it's missing something, and that's variation. So let's now add variation on. Variation. The more risk we take, there is a bigger chance of not meeting that outcome in a negative sense in a huge way, i.e. massive losses. Over here, very low um, um, variation, the outcome's fairly certain. Equally though, as long as the risk has an upside, we call it opportunity risk, it could also be that, where we take a risk and the actual outcome is better than what we expect. And this is really important in risk management, is that we've got to appreciate that some risks have an upside and a downside, where some risks have downside only. Downside only we call threat risks, Ones that have an upside, the upside we call opportunity risk, and the downside threat risk. Now obviously we need to be smart about this because the opportunity risk can actually add to our outcomes, the green side, threat risk can hurt us. Maximise the upside, minimise the downside. Now one of the things that we're going to talk about in a minute is how far up this side can we go? How big can we get the risk partner to be? Well that's determined by risk appetite. In this instance, it tells me the marriage can never go further right than that blue line. That's our risk appetite. All right, now I'm going to talk about risk appetite in a second. So the key is, the higher the risk, the greater the expected reward. However, the greater the variation around that expected outcome. So now we understand the relationship dynamics. So I want to talk now about the managing the marriage. The keys to a happy, sustainable marriage making great relationship decisions, because a lot of what we do in risk management should be focused on helping our people make better decisions. In a marriage, good decisions will equal sustainable marriage. And finally, incentives for success. Let's have a look. Now the keys to success, number one, understand each partner really well. Get to know your partner extremely well before you go and walk down the aisle, know each other. So get to know reward really well and get to know risk really well. Understand the needs of each partner. What is the needs of reward? Where does that come from? Strategic plans and business plans. Understand the needs of risk. What are the risk targets? What are we aiming for? What's the right balance? Understand the boundaries around the relationship, particularly around risk appetite. Ensure both partners have equal say in the relationship. I would argue a relationship where one partner dominates the other is not going to end in uh, a happy position. It's going to have a limited life. Equally, a business that downgrades risk to the detriment of reward. We know what that looks like. A decision is made, it's all based on reward. And when it's made, someone says, uh, can you tell risk? Apparently they have to do some tick off or something. That's disgraceful. Risk should be at the table at the same time reward is at the table so their voices are heard equally. Ensure uh, the performance of the marriage is measured based on the optimal outcome for both partners, not just one. We have so many incentive schemes based purely on reward. Yeah? Sales volumes and goodness knows what, and we see that in financial services a lot, and that ends in tears. Ensure that those that make decisions that affect the partnership are incentivised 
for both risk and reward performance. So the incentive scheme is there to make sure the balance between the partners are managed appropriately. So let's go to two of those. Let's understand then the reward partner really well. And for that, we need a really good strategic plan, which is where do we want to be in three years' time, and a great business plan of how are we going to get there. I'm still amazed at the number of times we go out to clients and we start doing risk work with them, and I always ask for a series of information from the customer or the client. And at the top of the list is the strategic plan and business plans. So many times I get a call back saying, we want to know why you want these. And I just shake my head and go, what on earth is happening? There is an organisation that doesn't in any way link risk with reward. Or secondly, they say, well, actually, um, our strategic plan and business plan isn't very good. We don't have very measurable targets. So we often backfill. We don't really do strategic planning as a firm, but we do because we get dragged back into doing it because you can't do any decent risk management unless you have a very strong strategic and business plan with measurable KPI targets. The second part then is risk appetite. What is the maximum amount of risk that we are allowed to take? And this puts kind of a size around the risk partner. Now we think about what risk appetite is, the maximum amount of risk that we are willing to take in pursuit of our objectives. So how big, I don't mean physical, but how big can the reward risk partner be? Because that is going to determine the maximum size of the reward partner because they are linked. Now in this instance, we call the risk appetite freedom within boundaries. Freedom within boundaries. So I want to give you a little illustration of this and at the same time, we're going to use this illustration to really have a look at the relationship between risk and reward for decision making. So let's start off then with risk appetite and an illustration. I want you to imagine that you and your partner have two children, Jenny, we've already met Jenny, and Johnny. And this weekend you want to go to the local park and your objective with your partner is to have wine and cheese and chat about the film you saw last night uh, on a picnic rug in the middle of the park. There it is there, the picnic rug. Johnny and Jenny, they've got a different idea. They're off, they want to go play, they want adventure and fun. They go, we're off dad, mum. And you go, wait a sec, before you go, don't go too far away. Why? Because over there, there's really high trees. There's a rock ledge over there. There's a main road over this side, a river over here. And we know that the further they go away from the picnic rug, the greater the risk. It's a risk proxy or a risk indicator. In addition, we can't supervise them as well, so our controls are weaker the further they go away. So Johnny says, how far is that, Dad or Mum? Now, you're not allowed to mark the park, so the line's a little bit, of invis a bit invisible, but it's about there, in your head. And poor old Johnny doesn't know quite where that is, and you have to explain it. So you say to Johnny, it's a pretty big area. Now, in our view of the world, um, big is risk appetite. Appetite is the size of risk manifested in a qualitative measure. Qualitative. It's fantastic for mum and dad to discuss the relative risk appetites we have. Now, mum and dad might say, well, playing risk, medium. Sugar risk, zero. I don't know, I'm making this up. So it's good to articulate the relativities between your different risk types. However, poor old Johnny doesn't know what big is. So it's not very good to operationalise into the business so that your business decision makers can make decisions. What do we need? We need a measurable metric that supports that appetite. I'd suggest the best one we might have is metres from the picnic rug. So we now put 22 metres away. Now that is a tolerance supported with a measurable indicator. Now we are assuming Johnny and Jenny know what's, what a metre is, so we need to educate them in what that indicator means, but we'll assume they do. And once we've got that, they now know that they are free to play within that circle, but they're not allowed to go outside, and they are free to do what they like in that circle to have fun. Now ordinarily in risk management, we generally like colours, so what we generally do is we have an inner sanctum called the green zone, which means within appetite, no action required, is what most of us say. Between there and the boundary, we usually have amber, which means within appetite, raised attention, and outside is pretty obvious, which is outside of appetite, action required. Now that then gives us our classic rag, red, amber, green. Some of you might have red, amber, green, pink, blue spots, whatever, it doesn't matter. I've just got three, it seems to be the most basic. Now in addition, we've got capacity, and capacity is the point at which you take risk that could threaten your survival. 
and that's when Johnny and Jenny walk across the main road over here or go into the river. So we have now capacity, maximum risk we're able to take, come back in, we have appetite, come back in, we then have a trigger, which gives us our green, amber, red. Now that then gives us a maximum amount over the size of the risk partner. Now that is critically important because the bigger the risk partner on average, the greater the reward, but equally the greater the potential variation. So you want the kids to have fun, but you don't want to risk their personal health to a degree, which is obviously potentially going to be long-term injury. So that then leads us to relationship decision-making. The first major objective of risk management is sustainable reward. How do we get that at a micro level through better decision-making, risk-reward decision-making? Now, when you make a risk-reward decision in a relationship in your business, step number one is to ask the question, can I? The can I test. And the can I test is, is the level of risk in the decision within your risk appetite? If the answer is no, you can't. If it is, you can. Now there's a second risk appetite called society's risk appetite, which is given to us by compliance, compliance obligations. So is it within the law, yes or no? Is it within your risk appetite, yes or no? If either of those answers is outside, the answer is we can't do it. If it's within, it means we might do it but not necessarily we will, we might. We then move on to the second question. If it is within appetite, we move on to the should I test, the should I test. And the should I is where we balance the reward with the risk. Hey, this looks like having a look at a relationship decision. What is the optimal relationship between the reward and risk once we've determined the maximum size of risk? So let's go back to the picnic rug and apply the should I test, the should I test. Now, in order to do this, we need one more zone, and that zone is in the middle called the blue zone. Some of our clients have it, not all, and it's a one metre boundary around the picnic rug. You're going to see what, well, how we use that in a second. Now, once we've got that, you then need a really good risk system. Now, this risk system is an app on your iPhone which uh, measures the location of the kids with respect to the picnic rug by geolocating the kids with a chip somewhere and we can measure how far away are from the picnic rug. So let's have a read. Okay, beep, beep, beep. 23 metres, which means they're in the red zone. Now you're having a lovely chat with your partner. If it goes into red, you need to interrupt your partner and say, excuse me, and go running off, grab Johnny Jenny by the ear, pull them back in. What the hell are you doing out there? Because red is outside of appetite. Don't tell me you're having a great time. It's irrelevant because you are outside of appetite. Now, unfortunately, a lot of people in risk management start accepting red as the norm. Maybe the CBA from the APRA report highlighted that red became the norm. We often call it the SOAR report, the sea of red, and it becomes normal. That's unacceptable, yeah, totally unacceptable. The next then is 21 metres, and 21 metres is just on the amber zone. 21 metres, amber zone. A lot of people think amber is not good. Right? I disagree. It depends on the other partner in the relationship. A lot of people go, if it's in amber, get it back to green. Not necessarily. So let's think what I'm going to do if it's in amber. I'm chatting with my partner. They're in a good bit about the film. And I say, look, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but can I just quickly ask a question of the kids? Because it's without, within appetite raised attention. So what I do now, I call over to Johnny and Jenny. I go, what are you doing over there? And the first thing they say is, ah, oh, we're playing our iPads. What am I going to say if they're playing their iPads? I'm going to say, for God's sake, come back into the picnic rug. Why? Because I know they can get the same reward playing their iPad, sitting on the picnic rug with a lot less risk. So that is not a good relationship dynamic. So I'd go, come on, get yourself back here. Or they say, ah, oh, Dad, we found a fantastic cave. Bats are in here, Bear, Bear Grylls is with us down here. We're having so much fun. So what am I going to say now? I'm going to say, good on you guys. Awesome. Tell us all about it when you get back, because they've justified that the reward is worth it for using that level of risk. There's the relationship. Next. Right, 14 metres, they're in the green zone. What am I going to do now? We're talking about a great part of the film. I'm not going to inter interrupt my partner. I'm going to wait because green is kind of okay. And I'm going to wait for a nice break when they're done. And as they are, I'm going to just turn around. Johnny, Jenny, what are you doing? Playing our iPads. Oh, guys, look, yeah, I know you are, but honestly, come back to the picnic rug. I'm pretty chill because it's green, but it's not optimal because I can get a lower risk for the same reward. Well, they might sit there and go, oh, we're playing tag. We're having kind of okay fun. I go, yeah, cool, because they've now met risk reward. Or they might go, oh, we're bored. We want to go home. What am I going to do then? I'll say, God's sake, get out to the cave. Go and take more risk because the reward is not worth it. 
And then the favourite spot for me is 0.5 metres on a picnic rug, whinging, moaning, I've had enough, want to go home. What are you going to say to the kids? Well, the first one I'd say is, why are you whinging? And, oh, I just had enough. What are you going to say as a parent? I know what I'm going to say. For good sake, go away. We brought you here to the park to have fun and you're moping around the picnic rug, i.e. take more risk. And a risk manager should encourage the business to take more risk. I know it's against a lot of philosophies, rubbish. We are risk managers, we are not risk minimizers. And if we're not getting enough reward, we should be pushing the business. In financial services, we talk about the three lines of defense. I don't like the word defense. It should be called the three lines of defense and attack, because attack is when we're taking too little risk. Or they go, oh, dad, I've broken my leg. If they've done that, they've justified why they are taking little risk, and I would be remiss of me to go, oh, for goodness sake, go away. I'd be going there, 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 fix it up, and it's okay to be in that zone if you have a reason. Now that is then bringing the can I, should I test together, and you can see the importance of the relationship dynamics once you are within the area of freedom. So let's finish up then talking about the reporting the performance of the marriage. How well is the marriage going? Well, let's have a look. Let's have a look at how the male partner's going. There we go. A few little measures. We might call them performance indicators, and we might scale them green, amber, red. Uh, green's great, red's not so good. All right, so that's a little snapshot of how uh, reward is going. What about risk? How's she going? Chuck a few indicators on and see how they're going. So we've done it individually now, but the key is going to be to bring it together because we should be looking at the balance of how they're feeling, not one over the other. Now that then brings me to a section of the APRA report on the CBA. One of my favourite parts of it is all about the voices. And in that prudential or that report, some of you may have read it, it gives us some key lessons around the voices. And it says particularly that the objects of different stakeholders must be balanced. The voice of finance and the voice of custom must be heard equally. The short and term, long term objectives must be balanced. The voice of risk must be balanced with the voice of reward. Sound familiar? Bonuses linked directly to sales volume relating to how the groom is feeling alone is unacceptable because you're only looking at one side of the equation. Bonuses should be linked to a balance of metrics covering all relevant stakeholders and both risk and reward, which is the state of the combined partnership. So, balancing the voices, what might it look like? Well, here's the voice of the groom. Here's the voice of the bride. Now, it's slightly more complex than that. There's not only two people in this relationship, I won't go any further with this analogy, but there's lots, because each of the stakeholders has a partnership. The voice of customer, the voice of shareholder, the voice of employee, the voice of supplier, right? And what we have therefore is a matrix, and we have risk and reward, but by stakeholder. Now, if we look at that, and we measure all of that, and we put the two together, it might look something like that. Now, without knowing the metrics that's gone behind that, how do we feel about this organisation? Well, I would figure the shareholder's pretty happy. Reward's good, green and amber risk, pretty good. Customer, oh dear. Can't really care about the customer, do we? Both red on both reward and risk, the voice of customer is not being listened to. Employees, happy days. Great reward, very little risk for the employees. Sounds like a fairly selfish organisation to me. Shareholder and employee are king. Right, regulator, not really happy. Society, don't seem to care too much about that. Now that is an example then of a little snapshot of the marriage. What might it look like? Here's an example. Over on the left here we have the performance of the groom. On the right we have the performance of the bride. Now again, without looking at great metrics, what does this tell us? Well again, shareholder, happy days. Green reward, green risk. Customer, oh dear. Employee, pretty good. Regulator, not happy. Supplier third party, not happy. Now I didn't model this off anything particular, CBA, but this probably highlights what a report for the CBA might look like after reading the APRA report. It said the voice of finance is the strongest, which is the reward for shareholder. It said the voice of customer was not being listened to. It said that CBA were aggressive and adversarial against the regulator, voice of regulator. So I did kind of model it a bit off that. Now for me, if we instead reported like that, and this was then the focus of the uh, bonuses that were given to CEOs and whatever, 
the world would change. And I would argue coming out of the CBA APRA report and the Royal Commission is this is a bit of a practical solution to make this happen. And maybe we're, those of you that will attend the, the discussion on the Royal Commission tomorrow might expand that a little bit further. So finally, what does the risk side look like? Because I'm not here just to talk about performance, more risk side. Well, traditionally, and um, I think it was Arnu this morning that spoke about the different ways you can measure risk. So traditionally, we might do it by a five by five matrix. Very basic. We might add on to that some indicators. But to us, is that risk measure is a whole myriad of things. We happen to call it as a firm project risk in motion. And what risk in motion is, is coming up with an overall score of that risk by bringing all the risk information together. So in the first column, we've got our risk assessment, typical five by five matrix. In the next column, the results of our controls testing on that risk, right? our attestations on that risk, key risk indicators on that risk, audit findings, outstanding actions on that risk, the past incidents on that risk and amalgamating all that information up to an overall score. I knew this morning was talking about continuous monitoring, picking up you know, information from the Internet of Things. That's indicators, that's going in there. And this now creates a dynamic risk profile so that we're always checking in with the risk partner and going, how are you going? Are you okay today? And not shutting them in the closet for seven years and ignoring them on the Shilby Wright Brigade and then they jump out after seven years very upset and cause a crisis. We don't want that. We should be checking in with each partner on an ongoing basis, and I believe the risk partner isn't checked in often enough because we do risk statically and we need to move to a dynamic level. So let's finish up then with the motivation to create a happy marriage, and that moves us finally to incentive schemes, remuneration. And in the APRA report, it says bonuses linked direct to sales volume and sales targets should be removed. Hallelujah. We should not measure the performance of a relationship purely on how the husband is feeling. It's not going to work. Bonuses should be linked to a balance of metrics covering all relevant stakeholders and both risk and reward. Right, exactly what we just spoke about. So finally, tips for a resilient marriage. Right, not that I should be speaking given I'm on my second one, but I'll give it a shot because I've learned from past mistakes. Risk and reward partners are equal. They have equal voices. One partner risk supports the other partner reward. It is not enemies. A lot of people think that risk management stops us doing stuff. The business prevention unit, as it's often called, rubbish. It's completely the other way around. It's a business, business enablement unit. Reward requires risk. They can't live without each other and reward cannot be achieved without risk. Risk and reward are best friends, they're not enemies. Risk and reward must consider every stakeholder in the relationship, not just one or two, such as the shareholder. If you achieve that, you'll have a happy marriage and sustainable reward. Now, I've spoken a bit about the APRA CBA report, 111 pages, which some of you may have read. If you haven't read it, I, I did do a blog when it came out that I think goes for 12 pages or so. It is on our website as a blog. I'm also on LinkedIn, so please have a look at that. Now, I just want to finish with this thought, and it's something I couldn't tell you up front because no one of you would have listened to a word I had to say. And that is over the past six years, one of my biggest training clients is the Commonwealth Bank of Australia. I do all their internal operational risk training. Now, when the CBA report came out, my wife looked at me over the breakfast table in a wonderful way, and she says, Dave, you can't be doing a very good job. <laughs> and my response was this, and it's a really important takeaway for you. <laughs> okay, now all the training we do, and these conferences you come to, we can show you, and you know because you're here, we need to show people, all of us, all of our employees, the wonderful lake that is risk management. Beautiful water, very good for your health, right? But we can't grab their heads, stick it in and go suck. They've got to do it themselves. And the only way they're going to do that is if you show the incentive of drinking from the beautiful lake that is risk management, because then they'll have the incentive to do it. And hopefully they will realise that their reward, which they love so much, cannot survive without risk. And that way, we'll then be brought into the decisions up front and be an equal partner in the marriage. Other than that, thank you. Cheers. And uh, we'll enjoy the happy marriage tonight when we have our, uh, have our, uh, have our dinner. Thank you. <laughs>